Hi everyone. My name is Adam Freed and I've spent weeks preparing this presentation and I want to thank all of you for coming um, and given the events of the past week, days, I wasn't even sure if I was going to do it. I'm going to be scrapping a lot of the presentation because I know everyone's busy, but I still want to show the film because I think it's, especially at this time, it's really important. Um, before I started filming this, I went to my favorite Italian deli. And that deli is located on the same street where Kristallnacht, Night of the Broken Glass, happened in uh, 1938. It's amazing to me that things like this is, are, are still happening to the Jewish people. I grew up Jewish, and you'll see that in, in the film and the presentation. I'm about to show some things um, about my life living here in Germany. So with a little bit more of a, of a subdued presentation, um, I'm still going to go ahead and show it. And again, I thank everyone for being here. Um, and just know I, I appreciate everyone supporting this because as Jewish people, we absolutely have to stick together. And during this, you might see my, uh, I'm working with a, a green screen behind me. And so you might see my hair change, my clothes change. I'm just doing the best I can to get my message out there to the most people possible. So I want to tell you a story. Right in front of me, this is um, one of my prized possessions that I just came across. It's a hanger from a company called Kaufhaus Tietz. Kaufhaus Tietz was a department store in Germany started by a man named Hermann Tietz who died in the early 1900s and his family kept the department store going and it was really one of Germany's first department stores. So when the Nazis came to power in Germany in 1933, the Tietz family was prosecuted, the stores were boycotted. The store in Regensburg here was, was located about three blocks from me and here's some pictures of it today and in the past. And from these pictures, you can see this is the street that Kristallnacht happened in 1938. After Kristallnacht, the business was sold to a German named uh, George Karg, non-Jewish owner who bought the company for pennies. He changed the name to the Hurdy department store. And this is an image from the new company gathering in 1938. And Hurdy was a, an abbreviation of Herman, from Herman Tietz. This man, George Karg, who took it over, he, a few years later, partnered with another man who had a company that he acquired from a person called Carl Amson Joel. In the next few years, these two men started another company that did laundry and clothing and actually ended up supplying uniforms for the German army and for the forced laborers during the Second World War. This hangar really belongs in a museum and hopefully someday I'll get it there. And George and his partner who took over the company from Carl Amson Joel. Carl Amson Joel was the grandfather of Billy Joel. And this is just one story out of so many stories that come out of Germany during the war. And now I'm gonna show you some of my story about living here. And again, I apologize for the change in tone, and it may be a little more upbeat. Originally, I set up my organization, Visual History Initiative, to support Jewish education and also the Anti-Defamation League. And that's what Visual History Initiative was all about and set up to do. But after the events of this past week, um, I asked a friend of mine who's from Israel, I, you know, how can I help? What can I do? And he said to donate to Magen David Adom, basically the Israeli Red Cross organization. So for this film and at this time, that's where our donations are going to go. So first I want to explain a little bit about how I got here. So about five or six years ago, I was wanted to take a vacation to Europe. And I meet a wonderful woman by the side of the Isar River in Munich. I know, very romantic. And six months, long story short, six months later, we're married, living in the US. We decided to have a child together. Um, we decided to have that child back in Germany. 
where she was from, her family's from. And I said, sure, let's go. We have our beautiful daughter. And then unfortunately, six months later, we get divorced. Um, I never want to leave my daughter. So here I am now living in Germany. And that's how I found myself as a Jewish person from the US living in the middle of Bavaria, Southern Germany in a city called Regensburg. So one day I'm walking with my now ex-wife and we're walking in an area known as Stadtamhof. It's a beautiful little area just on the other side of the Steinebrücke, which is one of the oldest stone bridges in the world. And I'll get to a little bit more of the history of Regensburg after we watch the walk. So she says to me that that building right there is a concentration camp or was a concentration camp. And, you know, I grew up like most of you learning about the Holocaust, watching documentaries. And the fact that there was this concentration camp, it's actually called a sub camp in the middle of the city. Uh, I was just blown away. So I started doing my research, the amount of information that's out there and the amount of these sub camps that were located in Germany and also all over Europe was staggering to me. So I bought a book. Let me show you that book. This is uh, like an encyclopedia of all the camps. And this one is a thousand pages long. There are one, two, three, five volumes of camps that make up this, this whole set. And like I said, once you start digging in, it goes pretty deep. So this was the beginning of me wanting to make documentary films because I knew if I had never heard about these camps, I'm sure 99% of the people in the US had never heard about them. I want to educate people, not only in the US, but also around the world about these camps because not many people know about them. So I called my friend Mike Harrigan, who's a successful director in Los Angeles. Here we are on the freshman high school baseball team. And we actually made a feature length documentary and that's called Everything's Kosher. And it's about my life and family reconciliation and also what it took for me to really rediscover after many decades of kind of ignoring my Jewish heritage. So with that, I want to show you a trailer for the film Everything's Kosher. Show of hands. Who thinks I'm crazy to open up a Jewish deli in Germany? And that would be the best way to lose a million dollars. I feel like I'm the only Jew in Germany. You're not. Do you make challah bread? No. Are you Jewish? No, I'm not Jewish. You no. see my hair? I would give my right hand for a garbage disposal. I don't even know what it is. They don't build it in Germany. Maybe they are scared of... of... Since my ex was German, she wanted to raise our child in Germany. So if I wanted to be any kind of dad, I had to move there. I have to figure out how I'm gonna support myself and my daughter. As soon as I drop her off, she switches to German with her mom. And she says, Papa bleiben. Papa bleiben means Papa stay. The year before I had my bar mitzvah, that's when my father left our family. Who leaves their kids with a letter? Doesn't even say goodbye. After that, I didn't care about being Jewish. Almost 500 people were crammed into one of those floors. It was used as a sub-concentration camp. Over 40 of the prisoners died in this camp. They would just toss them in the river. You can read about it in books, but when you're living here, <sighs> there's something that's connecting me to being Jewish again. Our tradition uses the mezuzah on the door. When you see it, it reminds you that you have a job to do. And perhaps that's a key to what you teach your daughter too. You can't get a corned beef sandwich to save your life there. You can't even find skirt steak in Germany. That is quite depressing. This is like a taste of home. If I can bring this flavor to where I live in Germany, that would be amazing. This sounds crazy, but I'm thinking about a Jewish deli in Germany. Are you joking or is this? Anywhere else in America, it would be tough. If you're gonna do it right, it's like being the Navy SEALs of restaurants. Be careful what you wish for. I miss a connection with a group of people. It's more about community. The people is family. My sister and I have had a rocky relationship, but she's always been there for me. If you're really gonna open up a Jewish deli in Germany, I will come out and help you. Check out, all right. Ow! Maybe it's time to reach out to dad. He's at the end of his life. He's the only dad you have. You don't get another one. Dad, I hope someday you will get to meet my daughter in person. Love that. 
Now those are some pickles. It's almost like a pickle meditation. What are the chances of you bringing me 10 pounds of corned beef? We got the meat. The deli is saved! I'm not gonna be like my dad. I'm not gonna stop. Lots of balls are dropping. T minus three hours. Oh, God. My worst fear is no one shows up. If you don't believe in your product, why should I? As Jewish people say, Lakayim. You are the best cook ever. <laughs> ever? I hope to see you at the deli. So, I hope you enjoyed that. And now, when we shot that film over a year ago, uh, it's due out in spring of 2024. Um, we did not want to make a Holocaust movie. There's a lot of documentaries out there, a lot of education out there. I wanted to do something different. I did not want to show bodies on, on carts. So I wanted, I wanted it to be a little more uplifting because the world needs that right now. And it's more about, like I said, my life in Germany, a lot of family issues, and really the love of a father for his daughter and really how I would sacrifice everything to be with her. Oh, and obviously, as you saw, I attempt to open up a Jewish deli in the middle of Bavaria, Southern Germany. What could go wrong? Now, after filming everything's kosher and then living in this town a few years longer, a part of the story that was important to me to tell was the essence of what it was like as a Jewish person to live here. So I made the walk. Now, before I show the walk, just let me explain a little bit about how I grew up. I grew up in a, in a very Jewish neighborhood. I felt that everyone was Jewish. There were probably 70 to 80% of the kids there were Jewish. Um, I had a bar mitzvah. But then after my parents divorced, um, we really stopped going to temple. And really Judaism kind of fell by the wayside. I'd never gone to a Shabbat dinner. I only went to synagogue for special occasions. And then I found myself living in Southern Germany. And this is my first film to be released. And it's being shown at film festivals around the world. I was in New York at the Soho International Film Festival. Next week I'm going to Chicago and then on to Santa Barbara for the Santa Barbara Jewish Film Festival. And it was directed by a very talented up-and-coming director named Johnny Stern. Enjoy. Every morning, the world's slowest gate. Every day makes me think, why am I here? How did I get here? This isn't a fairy tale story. It's the haunting reality of an American Jew living in Germany. A few years ago, I needed a break. Thought I had it all, but I was missing something. Fuck it, visit Europe. One day I saw her by the side of the river in Munich. Love, lust in minutes. Six months later, we were married, living in the US. All seemed good until we got to know the faults. Fights lasted for days. It was so good at the beginning. Therapy didn't help. Maybe we should quit. What now? One last thing to try. Move to her hometown. Birth, joy, I'm never leaving her. But the bond that was once fractured was now permanently broken. Every day I think about leaving. Only one thing keeps me here.
I settle into a routine, a morning walk. Thank God for him, Hamilton, always there. To visitors, this is a quaint village, a medieval world heritage site. To me, it is a daily reminder of the horrors that fellow Jews endured throughout history. Stoppelsteiners or stumbling stones, a few steps from my front door. Hundreds of stones in the village, everywhere, on every street. Each one represents a Jewish person taken and killed. Simon Oberdorfer, creator of one of the world's first velodromes. Him, his wife, and brother-in-law, killed by the Nazis. The kosher butcher, forced to leave his wife and daughter, never to see them again. A couple taken in the middle of the night, Entire buildings of elderly people, murdered. The children who once played here never got to grow up just for what was in their blood. Where the hell am I? Here is my favorite Italian deli on the same street where Kristallnacht, Night of the Broken Glass, happened in November of 1938. Every corner tells a haunting story. Nazis. 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 What the fuck? It all stares me in the face every single day. Right here, this spot, this exact spot, thousands of villagers watched as Hitler is driven through the city. History, so much history. Napoleon stayed here. Oscar Schindler, THE Oscar Schindler, lived right here. A rabbinical school here in the 1200s. A thousand years ago, Jews were here, thriving until anti-Semitism drove the Jews out of the city for hundreds of years. In 1901, Jews built a beautiful Baroque-style synagogue. Only 37 years later, this magnificent structure, built to last a thousand years, was destroyed. The mayor of the city, Otto Schottenheim, Nazi member number 1354, stood by during Kristallnacht and ordered the fire marshal to let that, quote, eyesore of the city burn to the ground. In the States, we'd be playing in an actual playground. Here, we play in a memorial to the destroyed synagogue. At the start of World War II, prisoners built airplanes designed by German aviation pioneer Willy Messerschmitt. He built one plane, then another one, and another one. About 12,000 of them. Until the Allies blew them into oblivion with 350 tons of bombs, which they are still digging up today. There is a street named after him here. I guess he was a hero. Auschwitz, Dachau, Treblinka, known worldwide. But what about Flossenburg, Obertraubel, Ebensee? Or the Colosseum, right here, on my way to the farmer's market every Wednesday. In 1945, this building housed almost 500 prisoners on one floor. Every day, prisoners marched over this thousand-year-old bridge wearing wooden shoes and striped uniforms the thundering sound echoing throughout the city. Everyday citizens, bystanders, what did they think of all this? 
Did they care? Were they afraid for their own lives? Before arriving in this town, I had no idea what my bloodline was. I did my research and it came back 99.8% Ashkenazi Jew. If I lived here in the city of Regensburg 80 years ago, I'd be just another stone in the street. Living here, I hadn't met another Jew in four years. In order to join the synagogue, you need to register with the city that you're Jewish, a tradition that goes way back, and it explains a lot. Outside the synagogue, there's a German police officer holding a submachine gun, finger close to the trigger. A person behind bulletproof glass approves you to enter through reinforced automatic doors. One will only open when the other is fully closed. I look at everyone I pass on my morning walk, like her, him, them. No one talks about it, but everyone here has a connection and a story to the past. From my friend's 92-year-old mother, who was forced to join the Hitler Youth as a young teenager, to a neighbor whose great uncle was a major prison camp commander, to even my daughter's great-grandfather, who flew a Messerschmitt plane against Russian targets. He almost didn't survive the war. Ironically, Without him, my ex and my daughter wouldn't be here. After taking this walk, day after day after day, something in me has changed. My eyes are open to what Jews, my people, my tribe, have been through since the beginning of time. Why? Because they look different? Because they're successful? Believed in a different God? While I don't have all the answers, I do know that the past never truly leaves us. Its lessons, no matter how painful they may be, shape our present and our future. When I walk the streets of this city, I feel proud of my Jewish heritage. I feel the strength and resiliency of my Jewish ancestors. And I know that while the shadows of anti-Semitism continue to lurk, we will always fight to never let history repeat itself. This is my morning walk every day through this city as a Jew living in Germany. All right, so how did you like the film? In the comments, let me know, or in the chat area, let me know what you thought. I'll give you a, a, a minute to write some thoughts. Okay, so for the film, I, didn't, I did not get to show all of the, the history or things that I've seen here. So I did want to explain a little bit more and I'll try to do it quickly and not take up too much of your time. But the things that I do see every day here um, are just you know kind of fascinating and mind blowing and maddening sometimes. A little bit about the history of Regensburg because this helps to explain some things. So Regensburg was founded in 150 AD, I believe, by the Romans. They settled it as the most northern fort of the 
um, Roman Empire. In the 1200s, there was one of the largest Jewish populations in Germany here at the time. And there was actually a rabbinical school that made the city really a, a major Jewish center during medieval Europe. One of the things that I find fascinating, so the other day I'm, I'm jogging through the, the city park called Stadtpark, and I pass by the old Jewish cemetery. Now, the old Jewish cemetery is actually the new Jewish cemetery. What happened was in the 1500s, um, the politics of the city or the area completely changed, and the Jews that were thriving here were banished from the city. So there was a Jewish cemetery that had somewhere like 4,000 gravestones, they were all desecrated. Where the city dwellers stole them, they used them for building materials, paved roads with them, used them in buildings. I'll show you a little video. If you know where to look at the old city hall that was dates back to the 1400s, there's actually a gravestone in the overhang, and you can see it right here. And there's a lot of these around the city, and if you know where to look, you find them. So one of these stones is uh, actually located every day when I go to take or pick up my daughter from kindergarten. Um, it's on a street that's named Am Judenstein, or Judenstein, which is, means Jewish stone. And I'll show you a picture of it. This is an actual gravestone from the Jewish cemetery, and it is in the cornerstone of this building. Um, I think it was actually in a different place, and when they built this building here in about the 1900s, they put it there as a kind of a, a memorial. But again, it's one of those things where I walk by every day. So I want to expand a little bit more about the Colosseum. That's really what made me make these documentaries. Again, I find them fascinating and maddening at the same time. So when you walk over the stone bridge into this area called Stadtamhof, and you'll see the Colosseum on the left side. And this is where in 1945, there were over 400 to 500 prisoners jammed into one of those floors. And every time I walk by it, I can't obviously forget what happened there. And also I had to dig in and find out why. And this is what led to, you know, leading down the rabbit hole. Of... But let me explain a little bit about Regensburg and why that camp was here. So there was this guy, Willie Messerschmidt. Willie Messerschmidt made airplanes. So in 19, about 1937, they, they built an aircraft factory here in Regensburg. The area was very depressed and they wanted the jobs. So they built this factory. There was slave labor working in there. And then in 1945, the Allies completely bombed it. They didn't take it out completely, but they destroyed most of it. And that's when they brought these prisoners in. I always thought, well, where did the prisoners come from? They came from a, um, a camp, a work camp called Flossenburg. Again, never heard of it before. And I had to go up there and take a look. So I drive up there about an hour away from here. It's right by the Czech border. And I go in and I'm, again, it's a, a brutal place that if you look at it today, the thing that blows my mind is there are actually single family homes located on the hill where there used to be barracks there. And that's one of those things where, again, I just, I can't understand how people could live there. So back in Regensburg, the prisoners were marched over this bridge. So imagine 500 prisoners wearing wooden shoes marching over a stone bridge every day, what that would sound like. People ask me what, one of, what are some of my favorite things about Germany? And I tell them that one of my favorite things is going to Austria. And there's a little city there called Ebensee. And on my birthday last year, and again, this is how down the rabbit hole you can go. So on my birthday, I decide to go to Austria and I go by this camp. So during the war, the, the Germans were making the V2 rocket and it was being produced in the northern part of Germany. After the Allies bombed it, the Germans said, we need to protect this. Let's put it inside of a mountain. And they started bringing prisoners there. And they dug out the inside of this mountain with picks and shovels and their hands and dynamite. And part of the memorial is the Wall of Names.
8,000 of them. One of the things that really made my hair stand up on my neck was seeing my name on the glass. And it wasn't just one name. Um, doing my history of my family, I found out that uh, my name, last name used to be Friedman. So this one panel will show you the devastation. So I had to go see the inside of these tunnels. They're, it's open um, as a memorial. There's a small museum inside of the town. There's a guy who's been the curator of it for the past 30 years. So I wanted to make another documentary about this camp because again, 99.5% of the people in the, in the world have never heard of it. So I sat down with him and I asked him, you know, why he does this. And he says he does it for the survivors and also for their families. And the really chilling part of this is when you go into these tunnels. Now I'm about six foot three and you could easily fit three of me on top of each other putting this tunnel at about 22 to 24 feet high. And this is just one tunnel about 200 yards long. This one section is the second one from the right on the bottom. There were about 40 or 50 total built. And I'm going to show you a short trailer for this documentary. There are so many uh, revisionists uh, still in, in Europe to say, no, the uh, Holocaust didn't exist. Where so much bloodshed was, new life begins. For me, this is putting a face to what happened. It is very important that the name is not forgotten. Yes, the name is mentioned somewhere. Mm -hmm. This is very, very important. Yeah, it's, uh, we know it very exactly. It's about 26,500. Uh, went through the camp. So I want to end this presentation with a story. The Stoppelsteine that I've talked about are really a daily reminder to me of, of what happened in this city to the Jewish citizens. But there's two of them that have haunted me since I really discovered them. And they're the stones of Berta and Edith Shield. Now, normally with these stones that I found, there's usually a family. There's a, a father, a wife, a child. But these two stones only showed the mother and 14-year-old daughter. And I always wondered what happened to the father. What I found was the husband's name was Berthold. And Berthold was a kosher butcher and he had a small shop in the city. And during Kristallnacht in November of 1938, the Nazis destroyed his shop and he was sent to Dachau, where he was only released when he agreed to sell his business to a German citizen for literally next to nothing. So. He got out and the shields were forced to move upstairs to the third floor. And Berthold set off for England to see if he could bring his family there to start a new life. And while he was there, war broke out. And I found a ship manifest that showed he was sent to New York. And he went with his brother. When he arrived, he did find work in a butcher shop in, in New York City. 
and eventually him and his brother opened their own. And he never saw his family again in Germany. And Berta and Edith were sent to the Piaski concentration camp where they were killed in 1942. This week felt like a reset of never forget, never again. And the events of this week are absolutely a reminder that anti-Semitism is still alive and growing in the world today. And it's completely unacceptable. We're never going to forget the victims of anti-Semitism and we're not going to back down from oppression. We've been fighting it literally since the beginning of time and we're going to continue to fight. So let's stand together, commit ourselves to fighting anti-Semitism wherever we find it. And remember, never forget, never again, and never back down. Thank you.